of all, I thank you all so much for coming. It's a, a fantastic turnout on a very cold, dark uh, January night. February. It's still it's it's cold and it's winter. And thanks for the book plug. It is available right where it is out there. I know we get ten percent, so I'm not going to make a fortune out of it. Uh, the uh, gay plan tonight. Uh, first of all, I'm going to introduce the panel to you. Um, I'm going to talk for about five minutes to give you a, a kind of an overview. Uh, of literacy from, from kind of my general perspective. And then I'll ask each of the panel members to speak also for about about five minutes. And I have a big trap door, uh, and if people go over, we'll, we'll sort of disappear them through that. Then I'm going to throw it open to <coughs> questions, do a kind of a general, a general debate for a wee while, and we'll see how that goes. But I want to reserve the last half hour to actually do something. Okay, we're here, we're going to have a debate, we're going to have a discussion, we're going to talk about things. But I think it's important in this forum, important with this issue, that an audience like this, in a forum like this, that we actually go away with some kind of commitment. There's a range of people in this audience, all sorts of people um, from across uh, the spectrum of literacy, practitioners, writers. So there are all sorts of people in this room that can make things happen. I want by the end of the evening for us as a group to have made a commitment to make things happen. I don't know what that's going to be, but I think there's the capacity in this audience for us to do something, for us to leave here with the possibility of achieving something now and in the future. So that's the game plan, fingers, fingers crossed. Uh, the panel tonight, first of all, Mark Haddon. Uh, Mark's an author, he's a screenwriter, illustrator and a poet, uh, and best known for his award-winning novel, the Curious Incident of the Dog in the Night Time. Uh, and he recently contributed to a book on the transformative power of reading and the impact it can have on, on well-being. Uh, Mark's worked with offenders in prison, most recently for Penn, uh, with young men in a secure unit, the Carford unit uh, at Holsey Bay. Alex Wheatle is an award-winning novelist. He's written several novels and last year wrote and performed a one-man play. He served a term of imprisonment after the Brixton riots in the 1980s. Uh, and that changed his reading habits forever. He's a member of Penn as well, works for the prison programme, and he recently took his words and his novel, Benton Brown, into a long-term prison uh, in Kent. That's where I was it? That's right. Which is one of my former uh, residences. Uh, Nina, Nina Champion, is <coughs> Learning Matters Programme Manager at the Prisoners Education Trust. She started her career as a criminal defence solicitor before moving to the voluntary sector, working on a variety of trusts, managing rehabilitation and resettlement projects. And last by no means least, Lindsay Mackey. She's our chair, chair of English Pen's Readers and Writers Committee. She's passionate and promotes passionately all the work that we're doing, uh, and her part-time job is getting me uh, into trouble. <laughs> OK, from my perspective, uh, yes, there is a literacy crisis in our prisons, but it's not a problem that magically arises when people are locked up. Although for some, incarceration brings help, I think, for the very first time. And of course, there are plenty of people who are illiterate, but who don't offend. But it's the prevalence of illiteracy <coughs> alongside poor physical health, poor mental health, drugs, alcohol abuse and unemployment amongst getting on for nearly 90,000 people in prison at any one time, that I think reflects a broader crisis affecting our communities, particularly those experiencing poverty uh, and deprivation. And researchers, and there may be some in the audience, have been on a long quest seeking that definitive link between such issues and crime. Does not being able to read and write increase your chances of turning to crime? Or does crime simply proliferate in the socio-economic groups where literacy is endemic. And if there is no link, then should we bother educating those in prison when raw resources <laughs> could be spent in local schools and colleges? But in trying to address these questions, we can go round in circles as prison numbers go ever higher and we try and emulate the states and resources are cut back. But I think there are some fundamental issues in the debate that we are in danger of really losing sight of. 
Firstly, I firmly believe this, and it's in the book, which is out there, which you can buy. Prison <laughs> problems are community problems. Might sound like a cliche, but it is something I do firmly believe in. Highly concentrated problems, but community problems nevertheless. But I think imprisonment provides an opportunity, a real opportunity, to tackle those problems in a very effective way. Most prisoners leave eventually. Currently, there's only about 40 in the system who is designated by the courts will never leave. So we can choose whether we take the path that means they leave better than when they came in or not. Second problem is one of, one of data. I know Nina wrestles with this one. We don't have comprehensive and regularly updated figures for the levels of literacy and numeracy. They're just not there. You often see figures quoted from the Social Exclusion Units Report. That was in 2000. That was 11 years ago. There are occasional random studies and they focus on specific aspects like dyslexia, needs analysis is not done on the regular basis that it should. And that's despite the fact that education contracts are retendered every three years and such information should surely inform those financial commitments. The education contracts are about to be awarded as we, as we speak. And I know Nina's going to talk about other aspects of the system that doesn't inform those contracts. There are individual assessments at local level, but they're done, but they're not aggregated nationally. Third question, and one I, I, I'd be remiss of me not to raise in an environment that we're in now in the three word sense. Do we consider literacy as a human right? UNESCO in 2003 launched the United Nations Literary Decade, the UNLD. Its slogan was literacy is freedom, and promoted literacy as being in the interest of us all. Perhaps it's the concept of giving prisoners freedom that has held back the cause of literacy in prison, even when it may be a cost to us all. But what about justice and fairness? I think we're just about hanging on to a justice system predicated on a fair trial. And our approach to terrorism, and it's particularly uh, germane now, threatens that. And poses the annual question of what freedoms do we wish to give up to protect the rest? But the basic tenet of a fair trial is that a defendant understands and can take part in the process. We breach that absolutely with an age of criminal responsibility set at 10 years. The trial process is bewildering for adults of average intelligence and knowledge. And even jurors struggle to understand what's going on. So what chance does a 10 year old have or anyone without average reading ability, let alone someone who's illiterate? The summing up of a case by an eloquent judge sentencing someone who's just been convicted, I know from my own experience, goes straight over someone's head. And there's regular prison officers out there receiving prisoners back from court, prisoners saying, well, what did I get? Add to that the Kafkaesque indeterminate sentence for public protection, which is still in the news. Even the media don't know what that's all about. We add to that a level of injustice which is unrecognized, but ironically, grudgingly accepted by thousands languishing in jail. We now have 13,000 people serving <coughs> indeterminate sentences. About half of these are on the IPP. Their release is dependent on the parole board taking a risk-based uh, decision on information coming from the prison. And that information emanates primarily from participation in what some regard as a silver bullet, offending behavior courses. But I can tell you, hardly any of those are geared to people who can't read and write. And you add to that additional problems of speech and language, which is endemic in young offenders, according to the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapy, are doing a, a splendid job trying to fight that case. And we face, with all of that, prospect of incarceration, I would say, beyond reason. If, even if we put aside fairness and justice, how do we manage and motivate 88,000 people and rising behind bars? There's a popular belief that incarcerated prisoners are incapacitated and compliant. Incapacitation is a myth. Compliance is on a knife edge. Running prisons on cooperation rather than coercion has served us reasonably well. Prisoner governors get little, prison governors and the staff get little credit for keeping the lid on when it comes off. It's the practitioners who suffer, and the bureaucrats above react by great phrase, you'll read it in inspection reports, strengthening the management team. It's code for sacking the government. <laughs> the risk is that the public 
whose vision of the system and life in jails is made hazy by distance and complexity. And we fail to object when decisions are made, but we don't do anything to tackle the original problem. At worst, support measures that undermine prisoners' chances to turn their lives around are lost. Meanwhile, prison regimes are diminishing, prisoners seeing nothing for them, prisoners seeing nothing from them on the inside and nothing on the outside. <coughs> 23 hours a day watching daytime TV is not going to be tolerated for long. Ken Clark's talking about a 40-hour working week. Yeah, maybe. And he may engage some. But there's an immediate need to engage and motivate people in prison without throwing money at the problem. Not least because there's no money to throw. Promoting literacy, reading, writing has sustained and motivated people since man invented the written word as something to write it down on. So let's choose. Are we so terrified that literacy and the work and the tools needed to increase prisoners' ability to read and write represents a freedom too far? Or do we want to accept that literacy is a human right and a prerequisite for changing lives for the better? Thank you.